Hey everyone, and welcome to Big Red Homestead, baby. And today, we're peeling back the curtain on Matt Rule's first season at Nebraska, taking a peek, trying to figure out what exactly this season meant for Nebraska moving forward, really taking a step back and trying to figure out the real story behind like Matt Rule's first season at Nebraska, basically the expectations versus the reality, where we were right, where we were wrong about this team and this year, and what we can learn and do better moving forward and what to expect from Matt Rule in Nebraska in the future. So we have a lot to talk about today. Caleb, how you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Still a little sad we don't have a bowl game as those things continue up. The college football playoff, what an insane scenario. The uh, the debate between Alabama and Florida State. Uh, what a crazy time. You'd never think that a 13-0 Power 5 conference team would not make it in. But but yeah, that's that's how I'm doing. I think it's pretty interesting to kind of start big picture, take a step back to the beginning and the expectations going into the season a little bit before we kind of dig into the details of all that went down. I mean, going into the year, most odds books had Nebraska at like six and a half or six wins. Like some had us at six and a half, which means they were projecting mm. a six, seven or six win season for Nebraska. And I wish many had us at six. So. I mean, PFF had his power ranked at 68th before the season. They gave us a 46% chance to make the bowl game, and they had us projected for 5.4 wins. So they almost nailed it there on PFF. But when you think back to the beginning of the year and the expectations going in, before we get into everything that Matt Rule did and, and how he set up his team, like what are your broad overarching thoughts on the expectations that were going into the season? Yeah, I think a lot of us thought that we could get to six wins because of the schedule, not so much of the team. There was. You know, Colorado before the season, you know, they had they were the worst team in college football the year prior, those non-con games. And then we thought that we could find a way with Illinois and they were they were kind of having a down year. You thought more so than I did. And Northwestern, obviously, they were they were one in 11 last year, new interim head coach. A lot of us had kind of chalked that one up as a win as well. So we thought that, OK, there's only, you know, if you take like a Minnesota game or that we could find two two of those other wins. There felt to be a lot of parity before the season in the Big Ten West. And that was more than true as the season, you know, progressed. Right. Oh, my goodness. It was so hard for anybody to pull away. Well, Iowa, considering the entire had, Big Ten West had a new quarterback and there was multiple new coaches yeah. and it was going to be tough to predict either way. And so then when you hit yeah. into the year, then obviously with also Colorado on the schedule, there was it was obviously really difficult to get a good grasp for what to exactly expect with Matt Rule's first season. And then we thought that we'd have an advantage, a coaching advantage for the first time. Uh, so some of those close games that we had been losing all those years, I think I know personally, I thought, well, we'll probably with Matt Rule be able to get some of those close games to, which, to get to that. In six some ways mark. we did, in some ways we didn't, which is just how yep. why the season felt so bizarre. So. Before mm -hmm. we even talk about like the transfer portal, quarterbacks and coaching and uh, everything else, how do you think we should be judging Matt Rule? What are the best metrics to judge a coach like this in his first season at Nebraska? Do you base it off of like past Husker coaches, Big Ten success, national comparisons, like average year ones? Like wh where do you kind of go when it comes to how to judge a, a coach like this? I mean, I think the... First thing is just the state of the program where it was before. Just how was Nebraska? How was the Nebraska inherited? And then how much did he do with those? Parts? Were the cupboards bare? Yes, classic <laughs> Scott Frost mentality. Luckily, we didn't get that rhetoric from Matt Rule this year, which no. was nice because having Scott Frost use that for for all five seasons was very tiresome. And obviously, this team we inherited has not won six game had not won six games in six years. We had lost many a games three and nine, four and eight had been Nebraska's life in these last six years. Tough. So I mean, in that sense, we did get one more win. You could call it that a success. And then also, you had seen that our defense did a couple things okay last year. Last year, we were tenth in stopping the explosive play rate. But right again, we allowed so much passing. You know, and you, when you split up the two systems. You can see some of some really great success uh, in comparison to the year prior, especially when we had so many players returning. I'm going to grade Matt Rule on what's happened the last few years at Husker football. So uh, that does include past coaches, but just win records as well. I also compare the other rebuilds in the Big Ten West as I think what is really important is how did Matt Rule do compared to Wisconsin and Luke Fickle, who again, a lot of us were looking to these arms race in this Big Ten West for the season. And then Northwestern as well. I didn't think I would be comparing, but here we are, an interim head coach, first-time head coach, 
doing a great job. So you have to compare. Um, I mean, if, if you're comparing situations, I mean, it doesn't get any more difficult than what Northwestern gone through this season in the Big Ten West. Um, and then obviously the one score games. I think we I think fans, Mike Riley, Scott Frost all had difficulties in this situation. How can we do in the crunch time with the strategy in which we end and finish games and quarters? I know that was a big criteria for me throughout the season. I agree. I mean, I think the criteria thing there is probably like the most interesting aspect. Going into the year, I'm right with you. I One of the biggest criteria for me was seeing a development on the offensive side, especially the quarterbacks, considering under Frost, we didn't see the development of Adrian Martinez over the years, and we didn't really see probably the a regression. maturity. Yeah, if anything, we saw a regression. And so... <laughs> that was why I was really excited to see what, what could happen at quarterback this year with Jeff Sims and whether or not he could actually develop and improve from what we saw on tape at Georgia Tech. Obviously, we know the answer to that one. We'll talk more about that in a second. And and overall, mm. when it comes to program building, seeing young transfer players... Transfer portal. I forgot to say transfer right, portal. Right. Transfer well. portal, of course, comes into play. And talent development and finding those gems. Frost really struggled to develop talent over time. And... So we are hoping to see, you know, those breakouts at some point in the later half of the year. You obviously have to take into account that this is a first year head coach. And I think the national comparisons are interesting. I know you mentioned like Texas and Steve Sarkeesian were like, you know, he went five and seven his first year. And now look at Texas. Yeah, there are those comparisons, too. I think those are all important to take into consideration when we talk about Matt Rule's first season at Nebraska. Obviously, the end was extremely disappointing. Considering four straight losses with a bowl game chance and, and the Michigan State and Maryland games were devastating. Considering multiple 13 to 10 mm. losses, game winning field goals. I mean, my word, you know, how many three. bullets can we not take? One, not two, not three. Insane. Seriously. <laughs> it's like, dude, we're a zombie out here walking dead. It, it's actually mind blowing. It, with that said, then I think we, we can actually grade Matt Rule even a little bit on how he wanted to approach the season and whether or not he lived up to his word in that sense as well. Like, is he following through on the things that he had promised? Kind of like a president almost. Like when a president comes into office, they have the, their things that they're going to do or whatever. And then you grade them on whether or not they actually yes. accomplish their goals. It's kind of the same thing with Matt Rule. Like, did he accomplish his goals? Like going into the year, he said he wanted to run the ball and play hard defense. He wanted to bring back the old school practice approach, like the Oklahoma drills and tackling. He wanted to prioritize the run game and a pro style offense. He wanted... To emphasize the technique with the offensive line. He, he wanted it to really prioritize speed as the biggest factor on both sides of the ball, especially at the, the skill positions, and really prioritize that in recruiting and in training. And then he wanted to really prioritize tailoring the system to the players that they had. So on so let's just stick on that for now. Like, what are your thoughts on Matt Rule when it comes to those things? Did he live up to his word in the in in those aspects? We go off the ones that he did live up i mean our defense was more physical than we'd ever seen our defense looked the most prepared yeah. to be a big 10 defense that we'd had in a long time you know even last year when mickey joseph became the head coach the first thing he did was go to live practice because the guys just hadn't seen it enough under scott frost on that criteria of a fast hard defense i uh, i mean it was the most it has had had been i mean since a bo Pelini defense and josh and i had been talking and comparing those two throughout the seasons uh, progression on how that was going to go uh, on the offense running the ball it was frustrating because it was inconsistent when you look at the stats of oh we had a 190 rushing <laughs> yards in the big 10 you'd be like oh and we we were solid Dominant like the whole year yeah because of the quarterback running and it's funny because also rule said he didn't want to run the quarterback too much at the beginning of the year yeah yeah he and wanted to be strategic with it strategic and only with the running necessary and that, and that absolutely was not that the was case because out it was the door, out the yeah, it was it was flippant running whenever we could feel like it because holy smokes we needed yards somehow. Our passing was just not there on the quarterbacks. Granted, I mean, I think we both saw progression for Purdy and Harburg. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, considering uh, I what think they were last year, yeah, that we did see improvement to this year. Yeah, and so that was exciting on on that case, but. You know, just still not there enough. 120th and in points again, per game, 112th in yards per game, 115th in points per play, 102nd in yards per play. Just wasn't great. And on the run game, you know, just you feel like when you needed to lean on it most, we weren't able to in the fourth quarter. And that's a big reason why I couldn't cl close games. And first and second down Rule, in general. Yeah. And for, yeah, Rule said, you know, I want 75 rush yards in the first fourth down. quarter. If we see that, we might have got it. But if you count it on the running back's feet, there's not a chance we got that because most running backs 
never hit 75 yards, you know, barely hit 75 yards right. a lot of times this season. So defensively, I mean, you're going to check so many of the boxes on what they did. And then offensively, it's going to be, you're going to just be so much left to be desired. One thing I, that concerned me with Matt Rule this season is later in the year, he said, I've always had a mediocre offense and an elite defense. If he concedes that his offense is mediocre at best, why would you choose the guy who's had the mediocre offense with you in Marcus Satterfield? That's my question. If it's only mediocre, are you satisfied with that? Because you said uh, clearly throughout my history, I've only been a mediocre offense. Well, isn't that something right. you think that you should have addressed with your staff if you're going to concede that Marcus Satterfield at best was a mediocre offense? That's concerning. I mean, his offensive has been great with Marcus Satterfield, but it's one of his guys, so he's rolled with him. But... And then also he said he also conceded that he wanted a quarterback coach and Satterfield to be tight ends, but didn't get that done. And so if you know that that was a concern and quarterback is the most important position on the offense and probably the all of football, why didn't you address that more if you think it's that Im imperative? And then also with Jeff Sims, you had to get it right in the transfer portal. There is there's no excuse that you can give me. You had to get Jeff Sims right. You had to get the quarterback position right. And he was one, I mean, he was the worst transfer portal quarterback in the whole country. He was yeah. one of the worst quarterbacks, if not the worst quarterback in the country, he especially the when it comes to turning the ball over. The entire country and you, can, and you can give me the excuse. He did. He did. Uh, you know, he didn't get cupcake games to start out. It's like, well, you got to get your guys ready. You get paid $9 million a year to get that guy ready to play football against Minnesota. Who's, I mean, yes, they got Tyler Newbin, who's a great player, but there was, Minnesota was by no means a good Big Ten defense this year. It, went five it was not the teeth. We weren't starting off with Michigan. This was Minnesota. I get that it's at Minnesota, but it's a Thursday night. Figure something out. Get your guy going. Get him in rhythm. And but honestly, more than anything, they just picked the wrong guy. And you can't do that. I mean, if you're conceding that you picked a mediocre offensive coordinator and you're conceding that, again, you picked the wrong quarterback. I mean, that's too The other option is whiffs. that they didn't pick the wrong guy is that the coaching is is wrong. And I mean, and that could be there is again in the Big Ten when it comes to turnovers, literally out of all quarterbacks in the Big Ten that played more than than 50 snaps this season, Harburg, Purdy and Jeff Sims were the three highest turnover worthy play rates out of all 22 quarterbacks that played more than 50 snaps. Literally the bottom three Harburg, Purdy, Sims. Is that just a coincidence? You know, like, no, it at can't some be. point that has it, to point to the system or the coaching. That, that correlation has to equal causation at some point. You got to draw plays and make it easy for them then because you put them continuously in bad spots and spots not to shine. Our quarterback play was the reason we did not make a bowl game this year. And that is a giant yeah. failure. We've seen this before in Mike Riley with Mark Banker. We saw this with Scott Frost who went through multiple offensive coordinators. A lot of it I think was him, but loyalty I know is important in the business and you want guys you can trust. But if those guys aren't giving you the results, then it's tough. I agree. A multi-million dollar corporation. Right. To your point, I mean, again, Satterfield and Rule go way back. They were on the Western Carolina staff together in 2005. So they go way back. And then Temple, and then he hired him at Temple in like, what, 2012, 2013? And then made him the offensive coordinator. And then they went to Baylor together. And then they went to Carolina together. And then they went, and then that's when... Then he ended up going to South Carolina and then now back in Nebraska. Again, we were so worried about Satterfield at South Carolina because the South Carolina yeah, fans two miracle were like, game. thank God you hired him. That's not a good sign. Not a good sign. Especially no, when your quarterback Spencer excited. Rattler, a better half quarterback. Like that's a guy that and can I don't make think plays. It's, it's not wrong to hire your guys. And again, if Marcus Satterfield, like we know he's a good suck. tight end. Yeah, I mean, and if, you're, if he's a great tight end coach, that's great. But what you can't do is put him at a position where he's not, we know he's not good. Okay, so when it comes to Satterfield, then what's the, what has to happen next season for you to be okay with Satterfield? Climb to 325, baby. <laughs> we got to average 25 <laughs> points this season. Give it, give it the contract. Just like, <laughs> give him the contract. The 325 oh, contract. Uh, I mean, to it's be fair. Almost, it's, literally, it's literally almost that bad. In the country, how weird we have to be in like points per play or yards per play? Like top I mean, 50? Definitely, I mean, it, top 60? I mean, we got to, we got to jump 45 spots from like 115 to at least 70. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, cause you can win games there at least get to where you were at Baylor when you were really good. Yeah. We can't, fair. we can't be chilling. We can't be chilling at 120th. Like that's just not going to work.
And no. then you're going to have, and the, the quarterback pick is going to have to be better. I mean, right. so if much. If you swing and miss again, I mean, if you're not at least a solid offense this year, like top 60, top 70, that you have to fire Satterfield. Yeah. There's or you no demote him to tight ends. I mean, if you compare us to Northwestern, who had a much worse draw, again, one in 11 last year, the one win being us. I mean, granted, we we did our job and beat them. They, they The coaching staff beat them, but they ended up winning more games than us. And, and, and they got second in the Big Ten West. Right, you know, and and that's something that you should have been able to do, especially when you have such a dominant defense, and we just could not find points any way besides the one long bomb pass, which Marcus Satterfield didn't even come up with. By the way, that was we we know that that was Tom yeah, Osborne. Option. Yeah, that, that our one play wasn't even from Satterfield. Again, Marcus Satterfield became one of the highest paid. I know he was an SEC guy, but again, South Carolina didn't even really like <laughs> him. He, he probably could have got Marcus Satterfield in a chance to shine where he's a great tight ends coach a year from now when he got fired from South Carolina instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of now when he you put him in a tough situation to be a year one head coach in the whole t- entire country and you then you bring one of the worst results. Right. We did not play good complimentary football. We tried to fit the square peg in a round hole yep. and it cost us game after game after like game after game. Like in the Michigan State game. game, we let them decide how we're going to call the game. Then we let them you know, force us yeah. to play an offense we didn't want to play, not in our identity. And our, and our offense just looked elementary. The decisions we made were not higher level decisions, not high IQ football decisions. We saw, I mean, at the end of halftime, the turn, the why we didn't score point. I mean, that the end of the first half of, of the Minnesota game was a great mi- microcosm for the season of we just didn't make the right choices, especially in the crunch time of games. We continuously saw that on the offensive side of the ball when rubber hit the road, when it was crunch time, we failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. And that's just disappointing. And again, I think it was just, I can blame Marcus Satterfield. I can blame Matt Rule. I can blame Jeff Sims. I can blame the court. I don't care what it is, but you got to figure it out because in, in the same way of how great our defense is, was the same way of how bad our offense is. And that, and that equaled out to, not making a bowl game and not a good team for sure. I mean, how much how much slack do you give Matt Rule and Satterfield though because of the injuries? I mean, obviously, like of course it's losing it's consistent. Eric, that's just part of football. Yes, you know? I agree. But this was an outsized, insane year. Not just that, but True. you also lose like going in you know, spring game. It was Xavier Betts, Eric Gilbert, Isaiah Garcia, Castaneda, Marcus Washington, Gabe Irvin, Ramir Johnson, even Ethan Piper. And then even, you know, Billy Kemp and, New- and Newley got hurt and missed multiple games as well. Like that's like what, eight players? The biggest problem was the Sims problem, though. And so I think that really hurts is like you had to go into the well of our backup quarterbacks because you made the wrong decision. It is hard to say with Jeff Sims, though. Part of it, I, I mean... It's unexplic- unexplicable, really, because, I mean, in the spring game, he genuinely looked incredible. He was, he was he like did, 8 for 10, like 140 yards, and looked so good, ran the ball, had the touchdown, and it was like, holy crap, like, he is going to be the man. And you compare yeah, that to how like, good he looked his sophomore year at Georgia, or his junior year at Georgia Tech, you know, like this, okay, we might be back, baby, like this might be it. And then yeah. we literally got the worst version of Jeff Sims, not even worse than his worst at Georgia Tech. Yeah, and any of his... Worst like, games. Was that him? He graded that for the whole was it, season. Was it Satterfield? I, was it what? What happened? Because like the other spring guys that look good ended up being good. Like we were both really impressed with Prince Will. Yeah, and we were both really impressed with Cam Lenhart. They played amazing, and we're like, oh, is it just our bad O line, or are they actually really good as freshmen? And they both showed sparks. Uh, and that was that just was one area where we definitely like that was when it comes to breakout players. Prince Will was literally my breakout player in the breakout players video. And yeah. he ended up, you know, having a 72 PFF grade as a true freshman. Insane, you know, so that's what you love to see. And obviously we had, but we had started the, the Isaac Gifford fan club, which of course, you know, most Husker fans assume Gifford was going to be great, but yep. you know, there were those things where it's like, okay, like we're seeing the development of these guys. Obviously when it comes to breakout players, I mean, it's insane. Some of the development that we've seen on the defensive side. I mean, we really haven't mentioned his name yet, but Tommy Hill, this it, it goes to show Incredible. the power of of this defensive staff because Tommy Hill's turnaround being absolute literal garbage can he made the team worse every time he was on the field last year to now this year having one of our top defensive players I mean and legitimately a great player in the Big Ten 
Like he could play on multiple yeah. teams, some of the best teams in the Big Ten. I and mean, and he he was our biggest big play guy. I mean, he had he had multiple picks this this yeah. season he and came in the, the clutch. I was gonna say he finished with an eighty one point four PFF grade. Omar Brown finished with an eighty two point two PFF grade. Those are elite numbers, and uh, you know top top. And he's coming back for players. next season, right? So you're gonna Tommy mean, Hill back, he, and so it's like the, that the things that Rule did there are. Incredible, obviously, as, as well with the development of, of Nash and Ty, and they're going to be back. So there's a lot to like there. And you have Prince Will, yeah. you know, Emmett Johnson, so many guys that broke out. Again, there's plenty of positive to take away. And again, it's just, it's the dichotomy of the offense and defense is is almost hard to fathom. <laughs> Having our defense be so elite this Welcome season. Welcome to Iowa's and world. Our, yes, it's literally the same thing. I mean, to have a defense so elite or offense so elite, and then you just wonder, like, is it is it the head coach? Is it the coordinators? Especially because none of our defensive players were really NFL guys. That's the thing is, like, I mean, right. these freshmen and these young guys probably are, and Omar may, might make the league now, and Tommy might make the league, and Quentin Newsom might make the league, and Ty and Nash now will, but they definitely weren't NFL guys. Like, none of those dudes, were, maybe Quentin Newsom was going to make the league before this, and now a lot of them will have a chance. You know, at least as undrafted free agents, which was never going to happen beforehand. Right. I mean, that was one thing I said in the early season predictions video. I literally said, mm. I said this quote. I said, I like some of the pieces here, but I just don't know who's going to step up and actually take us to the next level. And yeah, especially yeah. on the offensive side, that's exactly what happened. I mean, no one stepped up to take us to the next level on the offensive side. On the defensive side, we did have those guys step up and the scheme and Tony White, of course, helped take us to the next level. And when it comes to Matt Rule, obviously you you have to also give him credit for for hiring Tony White, for finding Evan yes. Cooper, for bringing that energy and and building that defensive staff the way he did. I mean, even on the offensive side, like Garrett McGuire, we were extremely skeptical of Garrett McGuire, and maybe the maybe the jury is still out there. But but yeah, that's that seemed to work that's out. what makes the that will, that's what makes the rating uh, again and grading of us so frustrating because again, our defense had a night and day turnaround, and then our offense looked worse. Um, yeah, which is hard to do. And yeah, it was hard to do when, yeah, it was already so bad. <laughs> right. Uh, we, our <laughs> offense last year was literally just Trey Palmer, who again is, he's an NFL Sunday guy, but maybe there was just no diamonds in the rough besides like a Bryce Benhart to polish to maybe be a Sunday guy. And then we maybe saw the true the freshmen case. making their, making their statements, obviously Jalen yeah. Lloyd and then Emmett Johnson, Malachi yeah, Coleman Emmett Johnson. and Emmett Johnson, each having giant moments to win us games. And maybe next year will be that much better. If you, especially if you bring yeah. in a, just a decent quarterback. I mean, how many times have we said if we just had like a Luke Altmeyer, we would have literally won eight games. Yes, I mean, if we had just guys that could mostly manage the game. With that said, I think we can kind of talk about some of the other expectations that we had going into the year. I mean, we can start with the transfer portal. Obviously, we had critiques of Matt Rule and how we handled the transfer portal. Of course, with a with a head coaching transition. Some things are just inevitably going to happen. Some guys are inevitably mm. going to leave. And of course, that really hurt losing guys like Ernest Hossman and A.J. Allen, especially considering the injuries at running back. But losing those two guys especially was killer. What are your impressions of the transfer portal, the net negatives and the net positives and the decisions that Matt Rule ended up making throughout the portal? We both said it was probably a wash or a loss going into the year, which, was which I think that take. was the fan. The, the, yes. the comment section did not like that. No, that was definitely one of, yeah, people were not, because they were like, oh, MJ Sherman and, we you know, Jeff Corey Sims Collier. Yeah, we did not think that, yeah, we were concerned about Jeff Sims. Said it was probably, I mean, I was on the train of, I think I said before the season that Casey Thompson was better than Jeff Sims, which yeah. it was a hot take. And he said he wanted um, to stay. Before the season. Yeah, so I thought Casey was was a better option. And so, yeah, that was, that was a hot take. And those ended up coming to fruition. Obviously, Casey had the, horrible injury at FAU, which was too bad. We didn't get to see how he ended up doing. But yeah, I mean, we just didn't feel like we got enough guys with experience. And it goes to show that experience is important. Stars are great. You know, four or five star guys are awesome. But you also want to see some proof of work on the field. And we just did not see enough of that from the guys that we brought in from the transfer portal. And so a lot of the guys that had already been here at State, and, and I, I think Matt Rule is right in saying, yes, you want to build a program not based on the transfer portal. We've seen that this coaching staff has the ability to improve players and, and build them in the right way, I think, thus far. Again, we'll get to see even more of this next year if some of these guys, these young dudes can make steps to become elite NFL prospects, which I think that there's promise that we're going to see that. Uh, and I'm excited to see that come to fruition on the field. 
But again, in the quarterback position, more than any, I think the transfer part, I mean, we see it, like even D Dylan Gabriel, where Oklahoma had a good team, he's out. Like we're going, this is going to be a frequent, frequent thing. So right. I mean, grabbing like, a good quarterback. There's not really any reason for like why a guy like that should leave, but he is because he can find a better home. The grass is greener. That's insane. So it's it's the new normal in college football and we have to get used to and it, look, especially when it comes to quarterbacks. You, yeah, and elite quarterback play. I mean, you look at the Caleb Williams, Quinn Ewers, all those top guys on those prospects ended up becoming good. So again, be able to take those swings at that. Um, but again, the developing players, obviously, we did a great job. I think around the board, the offensive line improved better than I thought. Than both of us thought it could. Uh, the wide receivers, again, we were just so young and had so many injuries. It was tough to tell. Also, our, the throwing wasn't great throughout the season. But we saw, I think I saw enough flash from Lloyd, especially, and Malachi Coleman. The running backs, again, Emma Johnson had a chance to kind of shine. And on the defense, so many names. The other things that I wanted to mention with things that we learned going into the future is that one thing is that we can, I, I'm going to be very willing to trust Matt Rule in the offseason this year. I mean, last year, like like after Miles Farmer, so he like basically Rule what kicked Miles Farmer off the team. Mm -hmm. And which ended up, you know, we, we highly questioned that. We're like, man, is he seriously sacrificing the president? I mean, Miles Farmer is one, you know, one of the starters. But, you know, Matt Rule had confidence that the guys behind him were going to step up. And he said, Tommy Hill, in that in that presser, he said, Tommy Hill is probably one of the turnaround guys in the time I've got here until now. He's one of the leaders on the defense. And we were, we were like, Which we were Josh like, Josh and I <laughs> obviously like, Tommy Hill, he'll never see the field. That's crazy. <laughs> and Tommy then he Hill said, and he said Deshaun, and then he, the three names he mentioned were Tommy Hill, Deshaun Singleton, and Phelan Sanford. And all of them had, were breakouts. Goats this season. Yeah, great. that's great. Yeah, and like uh, even early crazy. on, like also when I asked like about Cam Lehart and Prince Will, like he said, I see no reason why they won't play a lot this year and all these things. Like I, I just think that's good to know is that we we can trust Matt Rule in these in these posts in these preseason pressers about some of the players yeah. he's talking about. He's not gonna coach speak you out of the room and just say everyone's the best. So when, he, when he's not mentioning names like Heinrich Harper, it's worth paying attention to. Right, right. And when he's saying that they're splitting reps and things along those lines, and then when he's indecisive about who's the best, then that might be a that might be the bad sign. So overall, when you take it all into perspective, where are you at with Matt Rule heading into year two and a new Big Ten? Yeah, obviously the slope just got a lot more difficult. The Big Ten West is no longer here. Rest in peace. Rip. We now have, it's just the top two teams in a 16-team slugfest that is now the Big Ten, adding Oregon, Washington, UCLA, USC. It is going to be a very difficult and hard time how do I judge him? I think when he chose Tony White and he picked his system guy, not a guy that he had really worked with, but a guy, that, but in what he believed in. Look at the results. That's when Matt Rule. That's that's when Matt Rule's at his best because he does no ball, and he chose a guy that was great and again was head coach worthy year one. And you see that in Matt Rule, and that's the best side of Matt Rule. And you can see that that's a CEO move. Now, Matt Rule, in the same way, when we see him at his worst, and that's picking what we saw with Scott Frost and Mike Riley and the pitfalls and why they start still here coaching is because in picking the smartest CEO move, they chose their guys. How much is that worth to you? <laughs> You're sounding like, like Palpatine. It's like your friends are your weakness. <laughs> 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 it's not your friends or your weakness, but you got to put them in a chance. Your faith to in shine. your friends. <laughs> you got to put them in a chance to shine. I mean, overall, final thoughts. I think it's a success again because of the development of players. I haven't seen it since a Bo Pelini. And even then, I haven't seen it to this level. I think the amount of players that we've seen get snaps, get reps, and how good they've become. And again, we did even see the freshman offense get better in a lot of ways. And we saw offensive line. So I'm not just I'm not just leaning to the defense. I saw a lot of improvement. I just saw a lot of bad decisions on the offensive side. I mean, how likely do you think it is that that Matt Rule is on the Steve Sarkeesian path? Five and seven, eight and five, twelve and one. Twelve and one is a big ask in the Big Ten, but <laughs> yeah. I think but I do think but I do think we're on the right path. I mean, year one, we kind of gave a pass on kind of whatever win rate we got, we got. But we, I mean, obviously, when you're putting up good position, you want to see us succeed and get those. A bowl game is almost a must next year, right? Yeah, I mean, you just got to pull out those close wins. I mean, at some point, you have to start winning those. But I think Matt Rule will. I, I actually really do. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I, believe in, I believe in this a lot. And even 
I think that he, I know that he can develop wide receivers. So I, I'm even going to trust McGuire a little bit. I'll, I'll call it a success though, because I really do, um, with all the improvements we've made, I really think we can find something. I'm still really optimistic about Rule in the same way as you are. As a CEO, as a manager, as a leader, he's incredible. He's really good. When it comes to football, the football the knowledge and the, and the techniques and when it comes to coaching the details, he seems to be doing good. The The biggest question is just Marcus Satterfield. I mean, it's just a huge pimple on your face, bro. It's like... How do we how do we deal with this, bro? Today's class pictures, and we got this huge pimple in our face. And, and granted, if they would have got us, if they would have got a Spencer Rattler, I bet Batterfield's not that bad. We win eight games, and then we're feeling right. great. Exactly. So, so I mean, and that, that's the that's the argument. And that's why you, I'm okay with giving him one more season. I'm not gonna like scream to the heavens as long as we have a decent, like a interesting, good quarterback next year, and it has to hit. But rule, it's gotta, I think it's he's gotta doing be all a better. Things. He's doing it all right, yeah. and like you said, that it does feel like we're actually building a program. We do need to make sure that we keep these guys this year. Like I will have, there will be some huge red flags if we see like Prince Will or some of these other freshmen. I don't like think they will. Jaylen Again, I think we've appeased transfer. everybody on keeping them happy by having them play. I think that's what, I mean, we had so many, gave so many guys opportunities, which I just have never seen before, which I think is why we're going to keep guys because I've seen them all get better and they've yeah. all had chances to shine on the field. Like so many players. I I can't wait to go through and count. It would be crazy. I think they should all feel confident that the best players are going to play because it looked like each guy got a swing. I agree. So with us at House Grenation, drop your comments down below. We want to hear what you guys have to say. Let's check out the Patreon. We've been posting behind the scenes. We just posted the uh, PFF grade reaction, the season reactions to all of Nebraska's grades. So if you want to get see our reaction there, you can head over to the Patreon. We do a lot more like film breakdowns and a lot more content during the off season over there, recruiting breakdowns and the, the juicy behind the scenes details. So you don't always get to see on the main channel, but we'll be doing that on the Patreon this off season. So go check that out. We appreciate you guys for hanging with us and drop your best comment down below and your thoughts on Matt rule heading into the future. We'd love to see him mm. and we'll definitely react to them in the comments. So thanks. Long story short. Thanks for watching. As always, I'm Josh. That's Caleb. This has been big red homestead and guys, we'll see you next time. Go big, go big red. red, baby.